welcome to this class on uh, neuroscience of human movement. In today's class, we will be talking about uh, skeletal muscles. So, this is part 1 of our uh, series on uh, skeletal muscles. Okay. In this class, we will be talking about muscle fibers. We will introduce the notion of uh, sarcomere, which is the smallest functional unit in a muscle. And uh, in discussion of the function of uh, sarcomere, we will also introduce uh, actin and myosin and how they interact to produce force in the muscle. We will discuss excitation contraction coupling and uh, we will discuss uh, sliding filament theory. Let us remember uh, what our grand goal is. Our grand goal is to understand human movements. So, movements are produced when one bone moves relative to the another. Let us consider a situation, let us say that that is one bone, okay, I am going to call that as one bone and having another bone. Let us say for example, these two bones are connected by a muscle, an agonist and say another muscle, an antagonist that right. Suppose this muscle which is the agonist contracts. moves in that direction, then what will happen is that this configuration can be expected to change, say for example, to that. in other words, what was earlier 90 degrees could become an acute angle say, could be 60 degrees or could be below 45 degrees say 30 degrees, any such number. So, when these two bones move relative to each other, it appears as movements, right. So, all the movements that are uh, visible to the eyes happen in this form. So, basically the skeleton or bones move relative to each other and relative to the ground, right. And these bone movements themselves are caused by contraction of muscles. How do muscles contract that is the question. But before we go into muscle contraction, let us un try and understand the structure of muscles. I am going to keep this relatively brief because uh, this is a course on uh, newer science part of this, not muscle mechanics. Uh, there may be other courses that will talk about mechanics of muscle function, structure and function of muscles. So, I am going to keep it relatively brief. So, a muscle attaches to a bone via what are called as tendons. Tendons are basically composed of uh, elastic material such as collagen and elastin, proteins such as collagen and elastin. These continue on to become muscle or these attach to the muscles. The muscles themselves are composed of several bundles of fascicles, okay. And it turns out that so say for example, that is one bundle, that is another bundle, that is another bundle and so on. So, each of these bundles themselves contain several smaller sized bundles such as those, okay. These are called as a primary bundle, secondary bundle, tertiary bundle and so on and so forth. Within this, you know, let us take a zoomed out version of a single fascicle, right. A fascicle is basically composed of several muscle fibers. So, this muscle fiber itself is composed of several myofibrils. Several myofibrils are arranged in parallel to constitute one fascicle. These are myofibrils. But what is found within each myofibril? One myofibril is composed of so alternating dark and light bands are visible in the myofibrils, as you can see in the next slide. So you see that is a myofibril, and when you zoom in to the myofibril, what you are seeing is there are 
dark bands and then there are light bands. Characteristic typical of skeletal muscles. So, skeletal muscles are also called as striated muscles as in striated as in having stripes right. So, these stripes are basically composed of alternating dark and light bands. The dark bands are formed due to the visible thin and thick filaments together. So, there are two kinds of filaments within these. So, one myofibril is composed of several dark band. So, then one dark band is here, another dark band is there and then there are some light bands that are here. These are the light bands and another light band is here, another light band is there, another light band is there etcetera. This alternating dark and light bands constitute a sarcomere basically these alternating uh, bands of dark and light color together when they are connected in series they constitute a myofibril. Let us remember several myofibrils in parallel constitute a muscle fiber and several muscle fibers in parallel constitute a fascicle and several fascicles constitute uh, bundles of uh, of uh, muscle fibers that. Uh, so, let us remember several uh, myofibrils in parallel constitute uh, muscle fiber and several muscle fibers in parallel constitute a uh, fascicle and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, what do these thick and thin bands signify that is the question. It turns out that the thick band is basically composed of uh, two kinds of filaments basically the thick filament or myosin and the thin filament actin. So, when you see the area where both the thick filament and thin filament are present appears as a darker band and the area where only the thin filament is present say that zone right that is the zone where only thin filament is present that zone is going to appear as a lighter band. Okay. So, that zone for example, is going to appear as a darker band because both thick and thin filaments are visible here. So, essentially these uh, thick filaments are myosin and thin filaments are actin and it turns out that boundary between one band one group of thick and thin filaments and another group. So, here is a thick filament and here is a thin thick filament and the boundary between this is called as a z disc and uh, on the left you have one more z disc. The distance or uh, all the physiological unit between one z disc and another z disc is called as a sarcomere. This is the smallest functional unit of a muscle. Now, what happens at the neuromuscular junction? So, we will review this very briefly and continue our discussion back to the muscle fiber force production case. Right? So, action potential arriving at the synaptic end bulb of the presynaptic neuron opens voltage gated calcium channels that lets in a lot of calcium that causes uh, vesicles to fuse to the membrane and exocytose acetylcholine and whenever acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft here it attaches uh, to the nicotinic cholinergic receptors and which open and a lot of sodium enters inside the postsynaptic uh, cell which is the muscle cell is it not and an action potential is produced on the muscle side right because of a large am amount of uh, sodium that is entering inside which by itself is caused due to acetylcholine binding to the nicotinic cholinergic receptors so action potential is caused on the muscle cell right now what happens at the muscle cell that causes uh, the force to be produced that is the question. 
but before that what happens to the excitation. So, basically you have excitation coming in this is excitation this action potential is basically excitation and that excitation after the chemical synapse appears as excitation here. However, we are interested in what happens at the muscle level how is force produced force is produced due to contraction we are interested in understanding the relationship between excitation and contraction or more specifically excitation contraction coupling how is excitation and contraction coupled that is the question ok. Depolarization or the wave of depolarization that starts in the muscle cell travels along the membrane of the muscle cell as it would in any other excitable cell basically. How does that travel basically there are voltage gated sodium channels that regenerate action potential at each point in space and so here is one voltage gated sodium channel there is one uh, action potential there here is another uh, voltage gated sodium channel there is another action potential there etcetera right. In the muscle cell there are some special spaces called T tubules that have the structure that resemble the English alphabet T right. So, if you see here this is going to come down and go up like that. So, that resembles approximately a T. So, these T tubules have some special uh, significance for our purpose. So, what happens is depolarization arrives here right and close to the T tubules you have what are called as terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It turns out that sarcoplasmic reticulum contains a large amount of calcium sarcoplasmic reticulum stores a relatively large amount of calcium right. So, and uh, how does it store so much calcium it turns out that the details are too much for this class, but I will at least mention this it turns out that there is this special protein called calciquestrin. which is capable of attracting up to 50 calcium ions. So, because of the special nature of calciquestrin sarcoplasmic reticulum stores a very large amount of calcium ok and its terminal cisternae are close to the T tubule ok. This is the terminal cisternae and this terminal cisternae are close to the T tubule. Okay. And it is in the T tubule that depolarization is happening not in the terminal cisternae. Depolarization and action potential is travelling in the T tubule and on the sarcolemma is it not basically on the muscle cell membrane. The terminal cisternae itself is not depolarized ok. It turns out that there is a protein here a channel a very special channel here ok. This channel is a voltage gated channel it is called as I am going to I am going to write its name there it is called as dihydro pyridine receptor or DHPR ok. Action potential arrives they open, but they also open the channels that guard the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, here in the sarcoplasmic reticulum you have some channels these are 
channels that guard these these are the channels that keep the calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum locked right so these channels are called as rhinodin receptors r r y r okay so these rhinodin receptors interact with the dhpr receptors it turns out that whenever the dhpr receptor opens it undergoes a conformational change and through what are called as foot processes basically the food process of the dhpr receptor opens the rhinodin receptor so this is like pulling the other channel open so rhinodin receptors channel is opened by the voltage gated dhp receptor so whenever an action potential arrives at the t tubule the dhp receptor opens and it causes through its food processes opening of the rhinodin receptor note that the rhinodin receptor itself is not on the t tubule but on the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay so but these two are in very close proximity in the t tubule here these two are in very close proximity that whenever dhp receptor opens the rhinodin receptor also opens and this causes a great efflux of calcium a lot of calcium enters outside outside means what from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm of the muscle right so outside does not mean uh, uh, extracellular fluid basically from the sarcoplasmic reticulum the calcium enters the cytoplasm of the muscle cell or the sarcoplasm right so that's what happens so a lot of calcium goes out why does it go out whenever uh, action potential reaches the t tubule excuse me um, whenever action potential reaches the t tubule the dhp receptor opens and thus opens the rhinodin receptor thus causing an efflux or outflux of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm of the muscle right note how is the sarcoplasmic reticulum storing so much calcium right that's another question there is another process it's an active process called as calcium pump or calcium atps which takes calcium that is present in the sarcoplasm and packs it inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay so the calcium pump through an active process takes calcium and stores it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum this is how you have the original storage of uh, calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay now let's go back to the situation when calcium is released through the rhinodin uh, receptor right a uh, lot of calcium goes out crucial role for calcium in muscle function which we will see in the next few slides okay so what we have seen so far uh, an action potential arriving at the presynaptic terminal causes a release of acetylcholine which then binds to the nicotinic cholinergic receptor leading to an influx of uh, sodium when so much sodium enters that it could uh, cause the threshold of the voltage gated sodium channels it will cause an action potential and this action potential travels along the sarcolemma of the muscle and then uh, when it reaches the t tubule there are specialized channels called as a dihydropyridine uh, receptor channels which open which are depolarization sensitive which are voltage gated and when they open basically they also open neighboring nearby rhinodin receptors so these rhinodin receptors causes an outflux a great outflux of calcium leading to a situation called as uh, 
calcium spark. The amount of calcium that is released is so great that this is called as calcium spark. Okay. And we also saw how calcium is uh, stored because of the special nature of uh, protein called as calcium which can uh, bind up to a large number of uh, uh, calcium ions. All right. Now, what does this calcium itself do to force production that is the question right. We have not yet uh, gone there we will go there. Now, let us go back to the situation of the thick and thin filaments. Here are the thick filaments. Okay. What is the thick filament? What is the name? The name of the thick filament is myosin. The thin filaments called as actin. How do you remember which is which? Actin is thin, then the other one is thick, and myosin is thick. So, actin rhymes with thin. Okay. That is how you remember which is which. So, and the thick filament itself has what are called as heads, several heads. In the previous picture, it seemed as if the thick filament is hanging in air. Actually, this is not true, right. The thick filament is attached to the Z disk via contractile proteins very strong contractile protein called titin one of the strongest uh, or most elastic uh, protein known to man right so titin attaches myosin to the z disk okay so that is the z disk this is the other z disk and titin basically attaches the thick filament myosin to the z disk and thin filament hangs in from the Z disk. Right. Now, what is the thin filament composed of? We need to see that. The thin filament itself is composed of not just actin, but there are other things actually which are essential for its function. Actin is a crucial component of course, and it contains what are called as active sites or binding sites. These are the sites to which the thick filaments head can attach. These are the sites to which the thick filaments head can possibly attach, but it turns out the thin filament also contains other proteins such as tropomyosin and troponin. The tropomyosin is like a rope or a thread that is wound around the actin filament in such a way that in its rest state it will essentially cover all the binding sites of the actin. So, basically the tropomyosin in its uh, normal state will cover the binding sites of the actin filament. And on the tropomyosin, you have another protein called as troponin. This troponin has a special property that is, whenever calcium comes into the picture, whenever troponin attaches to calcium, it undergoes a conformational change. So, it changes shape in such a way that it slightly moves the tropomyosin. When tropomyosin is moved, what happens is that the binding sites on the actin filament are exposed. Okay. So, essentially the thin filament is composed of actin which contains the binding sites and tropomyosin which covers these binding sites and troponin which sits on top of the tropomyosin and will cause movement of tropomyosin whenever calcium is present. So, when calcium is present troponin will undergo a conformational change, but since troponin is attached to tropomyosin it will cause a movement of tropomyosin 
in such a way that the binding sites will become exposed. When the binding sites become exposed only at that time the thick filaments head can attach to the binding sites. So, at even otherwise the binding site is present, but it is not visible it is covered by tropomyosin. So, calcium acts as the key that opens the lock of uh, binding sites or in other words basically tropomyosin is locking the binding sites whenever calcium comes in it attaches to troponin and opens the lock in such a way that the binding sites are exposed and free to host. Uh, when the binding sites are exposed, the binding sites are free to host the head of the thick filament. Let us talk about the thick filament. The thick filament itself is composed of two heads, actually multiple heads only two are shown here, multiple heads in multiple uh, molecules. So, basically uh, there are two heads here and these heads can attach to the active sites or the binding sites on actin and then undergo what is called as a power stroke in the presence of ATP. At the expense of energy this can pull the thin filament in a particular direction. Okay. So, this is what happens. This means essentially what is going on is that the thick filament let us go through one more time what is uh, the situation. The situation is this this is the thin filament and this is the thick filament right. The thick filament attaches to the thin filament and pulls the thin filament in that direction whereas, here the myosin head attaches to the actin here and pulls in that direction. What will now happen? Now, there is pull in opposite directions here and since Z disc itself cannot be in equilibrium essentially the distance between the Z disks the distance between the Z disks is reduced actually right. Let us suppose earlier this was some x microns now it is reduced by some delta x. So, now the new length after after the attachment of the thick filament to thin filament and the power stroke will be a smaller length x minus delta x micrometers. Okay. So, important to note is that the fibers themselves are between 10 and uh, 60 microns in diameter and between 1 and uh, 500 millimeters in length. Okay. Now, uh, what about each sarcomere? Each sarcomere is between uh, 1.5 microns to 3.5 microns in length all right. So, approximately. So, essentially when the thick filament attaches to the thin filament and pulls on them the distance between two Z discs become smaller. This essentially is what appears as movement. We would think huh, we are talking about relatively small uh, scales how much force would this be producing? Actually the amount of force that this is producing is of the order of about 2 pico Newtons. So, 10 power minus 12 Newtons right. Now, let us compare the situation with uh, what could happen in um, big muscle in a large muscle. In a large muscle forces of the order of several hundreds of Newtons can be produced. So, that means, we are talking about 14 orders of magnitude okay. 10 power minus 12 to 10 power 2 at least. So, we are talking about 14 to 15 orders of magnitude in um, fourth space right. But then how is this 10 power minus 12 Newton converted into hundreds of uh, Newtons? Well, what happens is that several of these sarcomeres attached in series constitute one myofibril, several of these myofibrils arranged in parallel constitute one muscle fiber, uh, 
several muscle fibers arranged in parallel constitute a fascicle etcetera etcetera right and there are bundles of these that when put together we can achieve the scale that we need ok. So, something to remember, but let us go back to the situation of uh, the thin and thick filament interacting. We said that the, the thin filament basically is composed of actin, tropomyosin and troponin, actin has the binding sites and uh, tropomyosin covers the binding sites and troponin when it interacts with calcium exposes the binding sites and uh, the myosin its heads can uh, interact with the binding sites whenever ATP is present ok. So, essentially we are saying that the thick filament and thin filament are sliding over each other leading to a hypothesis that uh, it is the sliding of these two filaments over each other that causes production of force. This was proposed by Huxley and Huxley this ok. This is the sliding filament theory due to Huxley and Huxley and colleagues ok. Now, since this is uh, the sliding filament theory or the cross bridge cycle, we could start explaining this anywhere we will start at uh, say here. Whenever ATP binds to myosin head, ATP binds to myosin head basically myosin and actin are unbound basically they are disconnected when uh, ATP binds to the myosin head right. Then ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP plus, plus phosphate right. So, ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP plus PA. Now, this takes myosin to a high energy form. This situation is also called as the cocking of myosin head. It is ready for the next uh, action, next uh, cycle of action ok. Now, then when calcium comes into the picture, now here approximately here calcium comes into the picture. When calcium comes into the picture the binding sites on the actin are exposed then uh, myosin binds to actin. Essentially what happens is initially in the high energy form small region of the binding site is exposed to that region the head of the myosin is attached but it is not completely exposed because of that reason it is in a weak state ok. So, there is a weak attachment of myosin to the actin in the high energy state. Once when calcium comes into the picture, once when calcium comes in troponin attaches to the calcium and moves the tropomyosin completely exposing the actin binding site. Because of this reason the head can comfortably attach to the actin binding site or both heads can attach and then basically the inorganic phosphate is removed energy is released right. Energy is released leading to what is called as power stroke. When the inorganic phosphate is removed the myosin head pulls the actin or the thin filament toward the middle of the sarcomere essentially reducing the distance between two Z disks and producing a force that is serially transmitted. Actually that force is transmitted both serially and laterally ok, but lateral force transmission is a relatively technical topic deep topic that we will not discuss as part of this course ok. It also produces a force for our purposes that is serially transmitted. So, this situation where the thick filament is pulling the thin filament in the presence of calcium is called as power stroke right. Essentially it is pulling the thin filament and reduces the distance between the Z disk and produces a relatively small amount of force right. After the power stroke what happens ADP is released, ADP is released then myosin 
goes to a low energy state because there is no more ATP then myosin is attached to actin in a relatively low energy state this is called as rigor right. Uh, what happens with death right after death there is a situation called as rigor mortis that sets in which leads to a situation when uh, actin and myosin are uh, attached but they are not able to move right because there is no more ATP because there is no oxygen right because there is death right. This leads to a situation where there is a, a considerable rigidity right. So, this is called as rigor mortis those who are interested can read about it, but that is unrelated to part of uh, this course anyway. So, rigor is the situation when myosin is attached to actin in low energy form. Now, when ATP attaches to myosin so, when ATP attaches to myosin then myosin unbinds or disconnects itself from actin and then uh, ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and phosphate and then it cocks it the head and goes to a high energy form and then the cycle repeats. Crucial to this function are two things one obviously ATP or energy two calcium. If neither of this or if even one of this is uh, not present then this will not happen. So, this is the crucial role of calcium in the sliding filament theory or this is the cru crucial role of calcium in the production of force by the muscle. So, what we have seen is how calcium is coming into the picture basically calcium is coming into the picture via the terminal cisternae or basically released through the rhinoidine receptor located at the terminal cisternae close to the T tubules in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But once the calcium is released basically you have the remaining things which are basically the uh, which are the thick and thin filaments and their interaction that is enabled that is enhanced by calcium right. But then once there is no more action potential in the neuron or the motor neuron or there is no more action potential in the muscle what happens is that all the calcium is taken back and stored into the sarcoplasmic reticulum through an active process called as calcium ATPase. So, there is an active process energy is expended to take calcium and put it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, it is used only when needed ok. So, calcium when it is released it causes uh, the muscle to contract and produce force. This is the theory behind um, the force production by a sarcomere. So, what we have seen so far is uh, muscles are basically composed of muscle fiber which are composed of myofibril which are composed of sarcomere and uh, the smallest functional unit of the muscle is basically the sarcomere. It consists of uh, actin and myosin and non contractile proteins such as statin that hold the thick filament in place and we also saw in today's class excitation contraction coupling how excitation that is coming in causes contraction how is this caused due to the crucial role of calcium right and we also discussed in relatively good detail the sliding filament theory. With this we come to the end of this lecture thank you very much for your attention.